Boa tarde a todos novamente. Então, vamos retomar as atividades do nosso dia do DNA nessa tarde. É um grande prazer aqui apresentá-los, professor Dr. Juan Pablo. Nossa próxima apresentação será ministrada em inglês, portanto, se vocês tiverem qualquer dúvida, por favor, fiquem à vontade em colocar suas questões no chat e eu posso fazer a tradução aqui e ajudá-los na compreensão tanto das perguntas quanto das respostas. E em razão da sua de idioma, então, gostaria de apresentar o professor inicialmente em inglês. Uh, so, Dr. Juan Pablo Lopes is a molecular neuroscientist in terrorist understand neurobiology of psychiatric disorders and their treatment using animal models. Through a series of innovative concepts, tools, and techniques, his research seeks to elucidate the mechanisms by which stressors are perceived and processed in molecular, neuroendocrine, and behavioral responses under health and pathological conditions. During this talk, he will discuss recent published finds which describe in deep molecular characterization of all three components of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis under baseline and chronic stress conditions using a single cell transcriptome. In addition, he will discuss a new finds describing cell type specific molecular mechanisms underlying the effect of adult and early life stress the sustained and depressant effects of ketamine, as well as implementation of automated behavioral tracking and analysis systems of complex behavior for groups of mice. So, uh, well, Dr. Pablo, thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to participate for this DNA Day. And so, feel free to begin your presentation. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo, uh, for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, okay, so, uh, so let's start. So, um, as Rodrigo said, uh, hold on if I can move my slides here. Uh, so my name is Pablo. Uh, uh, I'm a neurobiologist, a molecular neurobiologist, and I'm interested in understanding the molecular, the cellular, uh, and behavioral mechanisms of psychiatric disorders under treatment. And for this, I study, uh, I use animal models. Um, and, you know, uh, for this, I study stress. So stress is something that we're all very familiar with. It's something that affects everyone, uh, regardless of your age, your gender, or the type of, uh, of the work that you would do. It's uh, what we've been feeling uh, and experiencing uh, together as a global community for the last two years. Uh, and if you're like me, it's what you feel when you have your favorite uh, team or your country play the sport that you love. You know, it's uh, very stressful to be a fan of Colombia lately, but you know. Uh, now, what's important here is that the biological response to stress is actually very good for you. Uh, we have to be ready uh, to able to respond and adapt to any threats that are presented to us by the environment. Now, the key here is to control uh, this response. We, sh we should be able to respond, but at the same time, be able to shut off this response uh, whenever we have dealt or neutralized the, the threat of the perceived threat that uh, has uh, presented to us. Now, it is the poor response to stress uh, that has been linked uh, to many illnesses and disorders. Uh, and this is a long list of uh, diseases and disorders such as uh, cardiovascular disease, eating disorder, metabolic syndrome, immune disorders, reproductive disorders, cancer, neurological disorders, as well as psychiatric disorders. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that basically stress is something that is affecting almost every system uh, in your body. Uh, now, I'll emphasize in psychiatry disorders because, of course, this is something that I'm very interested in. Uh, now, in the context of psychiatry, we know that approximately 11% of the world population suffers from at least one form of a mental health disorder. Uh, we know that suicide is the second leading cause of death among young adults. Um, we also know that the efficiency of the current available treatments is suboptimal, to say the least. We know that about 40% of patients do not respond well to uh, uh, any, the first uh, uh, type of treatment that is presented to them. Uh, so there's a very clear medical need uh, for improved uh, therapeutic tools. Now, when we think about the etiology of psychiatric disorders, we can uh, look at this in, in, in the factors that are affecting it uh, at the level of different factors, uh, both at the macro and the macro scale. Uh, when I talk about micro, I'm talking about the genes, uh, the molecules, the proteins that are affecting uh, uh, the disorder as well when we think about the macro stages is sort of the, uh, the, the presentation or the manifestation of the psychiatric disorder itself, such as depression, bipolar disorder, and so on. Now, in between this, we can see an array of different uh, factors that can influence this, uh, such as the cell types where these changes, these molecular changes are taking place, uh, 
uh, the connectivity of how these cell types are communicating with each other within a particular region, but also across different regions of the brain, how the systems are communicating, uh, not only in the brain, but how's the brain communicating with the rest of the peripheral nervous system or the system of the body at all. Also, we need to understand how normal behavior uh, is affected by this, uh, that by understanding normal behavior, we can see what are the patterns that then emerge into the uh, presentation of the psychiatric disorder itself. And we also know that none of these factors um, are present themselves in isolation. Uh, they, they actually always are presented within an environment or affected by an environment. And, and in the environment is everything that is presented to us. It's what we eat, it's what we breathe. Uh, it is the stressors in our environment, right? So we know through many um, epidemiological and association studies that there is a very strong link between uh, stress uh, and the development of psychiatric disorders. But it's the mechanistic understanding of how stress is doing this uh, that is still poorly understood. And this is a big part of my research, trying to understand this link. Now, my research implements a range of uh, different uh, complementary research techniques, uh, and these are things such as mouse models of stress and anxiety, state-of-the-art transcriptomics, as well as, as dance, mouse, uh, genetics, and viral manipulations. Uh, all this uh, in order to hopefully understand the key pathological mechanisms that underline the etiology and the pathophysiology of treatment uh, of stress-related neuropsychiatric disorders. Now, for today's talk, I will focus on cell type specific methodologies, which is something that I guess is in the title, and it's something that I was asked to talk about, uh, single cell resolution, and it's something that I've been spending a lot of time during my postdoc establishing and applying it. Um, so why do we need to, what are the advantages of using single cell resolution? Now, when we think about trying to understand uh, the heterogeneity of complex tissues, such as what we see in the brain. You know, these are tissues that are very complex. A technique like this could be quite powerful. Uh, we know that the expression of genes, or the mRNA expression of genes, or what we call the transcriptome, contains very important information uh, that can give us key uh, details about the morphology, the activity, the connectivity, and of course, uh, patterns that emerge into behavior as well. Now, studying single cells, uh, or obtaining information at the individual cells can not only enhance the resolution of the technology of the result that we're finding, but it can also provide cell type specific information. And as you will see through some of my talk today, uh, this is quite powerful. Now, when we think about the current state of transcriptomics, uh, you know, RNA sequencing is a technique that has been around for a couple of decades now. It's a very powerful technique that allows us to quantify the expression of thousands of genes with a simple, uh, which is a simple sample. Um, again, this has been done for many years now and it's, and, and, and it's shown very uh, useful results. However, what happens is once we sequence a particular sample, what we're sequencing in fact is an average of thousands of cells within that particular tissue that we use to extract RNA or so on. So we're extracting essentially RNA from thousands of cells, not just one single cell. And this could be good. I mean, it's, it's an average expression. Uh, but like I said, this could be improved. And this is what we do using a single cell RNA sequencing. So in this case, what we obtain is the information at each individual cell. We extract the RNA from each individual cell and we can quantify the expression of thousands of genes within that individual cell. So this is quite powerful because then allows us to then identify cells that really look very uh, similar to each other. So we can really cluster them and group them in ways that we can then tell, okay, this is a neuron, this is a specific type of neuron, this is a glial cell, this is a vascular cell, uh, and this really offers very strong and powerful information. I would like to use an analogy usually uh, for this, which is uh, that when we're looking at total or bulk RNA sequencing, we're looking at a smoothie. Uh, the smoothie is, you know, you drink your smoothie, uh, you know, it's, what happens here is you can actually taste and smell the very strong flavors, the fruits that are potentially the stronger that are contributing the most for the for the flavor and, and, and the texture of your smoothie. Um, and it's good, but what we obtain with single cell RNA sequencing is the fruit salad, right? So you obtain the information of each individual of the fruits that you have in that bowl, so that you can then deconstruct this information and then you know, obtain what are the apples doing? How much are they contributing to this flavor? What about the bananas and so on, right? Um, and this is very important, of course, because uh, we know that different cells differ in their functions and their properties. And by really isolating the functions, the properties of each of these 
uh, different cell types, we can really try to uh, infer a functionality for a particular stimuli. Or... Okay, so uh, for the rest of my talk, I'll tell you a little bit about three particular stories uh, uh, that I've been working or that I've worked on through my postdoc. Two of these are basically finalized stories that I dive in a little bit more. Uh, the one in the middle is just a little bit of a snippet into some things that are currently on the review. So just to give you an idea of how we are applying this technology uh, to answer uh, this type of questions. Okay, so the first project deals uh, with the dissection of the HP axis using uh, single cell transcriptomics. Uh, so if you're not familiar, if you don't remember the HP axis, uh, this is the major neuroendocrine system that controls and regulates the response to stress. Uh, it is composed of uh, different uh, organs, such as the paraventricular nucleus or the hypothalamus in the brain, as well as the pituitary and adrenal glands in the periphery. Now, each one of these organs is responsible for producing important uh, neuropeptides, such as CRH, ACTH, and then, uh, of course, glucorticoids that then lead to the control, the very tight control of the stress response. Now, a lot is known about the HP axis. Uh, and this is something that has been studied you know, for 40, 50 years. Uh, but it's the molecular mechanisms of HPA axis in function, particularly after chronic stress exposure, that are still not fully understood. Another thing is that pretty much everything that we know about the HP axis in the context of stress has been particularly focused on the brain. And it's, uh, it is a lot less that we know about the peripheral components at the molecular level. So when I started my postdoc, I thought that this was a very nice a uh, way to really use this technology to really dive in into, uh, into, into the stress system. So what we do is we basically exposed our mice to a chronic social defeat uh, paradigm. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but this is a, a, a paradigm that we use to chronically stress mice. So it is important to distinguish here that we're not claiming that mice are depressed. Mice are not depressed. But after putting mice through these paradigms, we can induce particular endophenotypes that are seen in depression. And these are things like anhedonia, anxiety, social avoidance behavior, learned helplessness. And it's a very powerful uh, paradigm that has been validated and shown at the molecular, cellular, neuroendocrine, and behavioral level. So essentially what we do is we stress, uh, chronically stress a group of mice and we have a control mice. And after this, uh, we can see that in fact, the chronic social defeat model uh, reproduces all the behavioral and neuroendocrine hallmarks of stress exposure. And this includes things as increased court uh, in, 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 uh, in the periphery. We can see increased size of the adrenal glands, um, the mice, uh, uh, their uh, fur state deteriorates over time because they stop taking care of themselves, uh, they lose weight, uh, and then they have deficits in social interactions. Uh, so again, this is all hallmarks of a stress, uh, chronic stress paradigm. So what we do after this, we, it's very simple. I took uh, the three major components of the HP axis, as I just mentioned, the PDN in the brain, as well as the pituitary and adrenal glands. We isolate these tissues, and then we uh, generate a single cell uh, suspensions in order to try to capture cell type specific information. And this is what we did, and we uh, sequenced about 22,000 single cells. Um, Okay, so this is what we, how the data looks. Again, if you're not familiar with single cell data, uh, it looks something like this. Basically what you're seeing here are individual clusters. Each little dot that you see here is a specific cell type. So what happens is uh, bioinformatically, we can then group those cells that look similar to each other, and then we can uh, uh, group them into, into these the individual clusters. And so you can see here is, um, uh, I hope you can see my, uh, my mouse here, as you can see, uh, you know, all the neuronal uh, populations in here, as well as our, uh, our more uh, glial and vascular cell populations in the outside. And we see a very similar picture for the pituitary and the adrenal gland, but we have our endocrine cells here in the center, and we see a lot of our vascular cells in the outside. So this is how the data looks for each one of them, and the distribution of the numbers and the cell types that, that we identified. Now we have found very interesting things in all over all these three tissues, but it was in the adrenal gland where we find uh, our most uh, strong or the stronger findings, both at the uh, the molecular and at the cellular level. Now the adrenal gland is a very interesting tissue. Uh, it's a very highly dynamic organ that can quickly adapt and regenerate uh, in response to different types of stimuli. And what you can see here, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the hallmarks of stress. We can see that mice after being stressed 
Uh, in fact, their adrenal gland uh, doubles up in size. Uh, and, and these are actual pictures from uh, adrenals that were used from the mice that were used in my study. So, um, so there's obviously something happening at the cellular level. And we, and we thought that by looking at uh, the specific cell types can give us an insight into what's happening. Now, what we see in our analysis is that our analysis reveal a specific population of overrepresented sona fasciculata cells. The sona fasciculata cells are cells that are in the inside part of the adrenal cortex. Uh, if I can, don't have one here, but I think I'll have a picture later on. Um, and so, and this is cells that are only, or that are mostly uh, represented in the stress group, meaning that we did not have any of these cells with a particular cell cluster in the control group. So we thought that the cells or the genes that are defined in this particular population could be important regulators of, uh, of chronic stress. And what we see here, again, these are sort of clusters of cell types in the adrenal gland. We can see is this particular cluster of sona fasciculata one group um, that is only present in the stress group. And it's these three genes that are mostly responsible for the expression of this population. These are ABCB1B, SBSN, SRD, SRD5A2. And what's interesting is that all those these three genes are uh, associated uh, with glucocorticotransport, cell proliferation, and glucose metabolism. Again, all things that make sense in the context of chronic stress or the uh, chronic exposure of glucocorticoids or secretion of glucocorticoids. Now, for the rest of my talk, I'll focus on ABCB1B. This was the strongest gene and the top gene that represented this population. Uh, this is something that we were able to validate. So here you can see um, a slide of an adrenal gland. This is a control group. You can see the adrenal cortex in the outer. In the center, we see the medulla. So the inner part of the adrenal cortex is where we see the expression of ABCB1 under control conditions or baseline conditions. But I hope you can appreciate that after stress, not only that the adrenal gland enlarges, but also the expression of ABCB1B diffuses through the whole cortex. And this is something that we can, of course, quantify, and we can see that the expression of ABCB1B is higher in the cortex of stress mice, basically uh, validating our single cell findings uh, using RNA scope. Then, through a series of both in vitro and in vivo experiments, we were able to validate these uh, findings uh, further. We showed that hypertrophy uh, uh, in the adrenal cortex is associated with higher levels of ABCB1 mRNA expression. We showed that chronic stress exposure causes the sona fasciculata cells to enlarge and to increase their expression of ABCB1. We believe this is due to um, mechanisms to cope with the uh, large amounts of glucocorticoids that are being secreted into the adrenal. Um, also, we showed that modulation of ABCB1 uh, B, particular ABC1B, affects glucocortical secretion, and this is done both in mice and human adrenal cortical cells. Okay, so, but what do we know about this gene? So this gene is the ATP binding cassettes of family member one, also known, uh, if you work in cancer, you know this gene as MDR1 or multidrug resistant uh, one, uh, also known as uh, P glycoprotein one. Uh, this is a very important protein of the cell membrane. It's uh, essentially an efflux pump. It gets rid of foreign substances that deems uh, dangerous uh, in, 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 in the system. Uh, in humans, it's encoded by a single gene, ABCB1, while in mice, it's encoded by two variants, ABCB1A and B. Again, this is important. I'll, I'll get back to this in a second. Uh, if you study stress or antidepressant response, you might have come around this gene a while back, and there was a lot of interest in ABCB1 um, in the context of response to antidepressant treatment, particularly uh, with a focus on the brain. And this is based in, 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 in findings that show that ABCB1 in humans is expressed in the blood-brain barrier. So it was studied heavily to try to understand how it was regulating influx or, or, or response to uh, not only glucocorticoids, but antidepressants in the system. But unfortunately, Although the findings in humans were really positive, really the mechanisms uh, that were tried to study at the animal in animal models really uh, came short. So sort of the hype behind this gene kind of fell through. But so our data gives some insights into why this could happen. So it was not known how ABCB1 regulates a, a, a HPA activity, right? And again, a lot of the of these findings were based on the assumption that in humans, uh, there's only one variant, while in mice there's two, uh, and that these two mouse variants will behave similarly. People thought that ABC1, A and B had similar patterns of, of behavior or activity, sorry. Um, and so we know that 
not only in the brain, but in the periphery. And then now we know that this is not true. So our data shows that here, ABCB1A has the expression of ABC1E, mostly in endothelial cells, and this is across tissues. This is consistent of what I just told you. I mean, these are cells that are expressed in the blood-brain barrier. But ABCB1B has a very different pattern. It's not expressed in those cells, and it's expressed uh, mostly in, in, in microglial cells, macrophages in the periphery, as well as you can see very highly expressed, the highest expression that we see uh, in, the, in the adrenal gland. Now, when we look at the periphery, we can see as well that these two genes have very different patterns of expression. And we know, immediately can see that ABC1B is the uh, predominant variant in the, uh, in the periphery with the highest expression in the adrenal gland. So again, we know that all these studies that they try to knock out ABCB1A or B to try just to study the function in the brain were really missing a lot of the side effects that they were causing across the periphery in multiple tissues. And perhaps this is a reason why they couldn't figure out before uh, their function in the AFG axis, right? Okay, so how we can translate our findings to humans. So, you know, we cannot take adrenal glands from depressed patients, right? It's very unpractical and of course unethical. Uh, but what we can do is we can turn to a similar disease in humans. And for this, we turn to Cushing's disease. Cushing's is a disease that is characterized by chronic endogenous oversecretion of ACTH that is due usually to a pituitary or uh, an ectomic, uh, ectopic tumor. And this leads to excessive glucocortico secretion as well as enlargement of the adrenal glands, which again, sounds very similar to what I just told you happens to our mice that go through our chronic social defeat model, right? So in collaboration with uh, Cynthia Donianu and, uh, and Felix uh, Bushline and, and King's College in London, as well as the University Hospital in Zurich, we were able to obtain adrenal cortical uh, samples uh, from Cushing's, uh, Cushing's uh, disease patients. Our hypothesis being that these patients should have higher levels of ABCB1 due to this chronic or excessive glucocortical secretion uh, that have been exposed to, to that. And, Essentially, that's what we see. And uh, so here what you can see are some uh, samples that were quantified using RNA scope in Cushing disease patients as well as control. And we can see a very strong upregulation of ABCB1 here. So again, just re reinforcing our evidence of the role of ABCB1 as a strong modulator for glucocortical activity in the adrenal gland. But I wanted to highlight the ABCB1 as a potential uh, regulator of the detriment detrimental uh, effects of glucose metabolism that are associated with Cushing disease. Now, again, if we try to uh, put this in the context of psychiatry, um, uh, this was done through a uh, collaboration with uh, the laboratory of Elizabeth Binder here at the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Munich, uh, where we obtained genotyping data from peripheral plasma samples. This is a large cohort of patients that are uh, uh, treatment uh, naive. Uh, they've never been exposed to antidepressant therapies um, and they're uh, severely depressed. We obtain plasma, ACTH, and cortisol concentrations at baseline and following CRF stimulation. So CRF stimulation is usually done, if you're not familiar with this, to uh, cause a stress test in patients and to see how the system is behaving or how the stress system is, is, is uh, reacting. And so we obtained uh, blood and plasma samples prior to CRF stimulation, then half an hour later, and then every 15 minutes for a total of four different measures. Now for this, we focus on a specific uh, polymorphism in the ABCB1 gene uh, that has been shown to have a, a, a functional relevance. And what we see here is that in patients uh, with the minor allele here that you see TT show a decrease in baseline cortisol levels. This is a, a, a trend, but it's not significant at baseline, but it is after uh, uh, patients are stressed that we can see a diminished cortisol response after CRF stimulation on this patient with a minor allele. What's interesting too is that we don't see any effects in the levels of ACTH um, uh, by, uh, by genotype. Again, suggesting that the effects that we're seeing are happening at the level of the adrenal gland and not at the pituitary. Now again, these results are consistent with our mouse and cell culture findings and support the idea that ABCB1 function can regulate HB axis uh, response. Now, just to summarize this story, uh, you know, using single cell technologies, we're able to uh, obtain a very valuable resource for researchers and clinicians that are interested in organ and the organism's nervous, nervous and uh, endocrine uh, responses to stress. And of course, the interplay between these cell types and tissues that is quite uh, powerful. Uh, we propose that the ABCV1 gene and protein are involved in mediating the chronic stress adaptation 
the regulation and control of glucocorticoids in the adrenal gland, and that modulating the function of ABCB1 might be important for the treatment of patients that are suffering from neuropsychiatric as well as metabolic disorders. Now, this story was recently, uh, you know, uh, published in Science Advances. This is uh, around this time last year. Uh, and there's a few follow-up that are working, we're working on this. We are trying to understand the role of stress in both males and females. And this is a, a, a paper that we currently have submitted uh, is on the review in Nature and Neuroscience, as well as a different story where we're looking at the effect of macrophages, which is something that we're able to obtain that it was not shown until now, a particular effect of macrophages in the adrenal and, and, and pituitary gland that are affected after stress. Um, and this is a manuscript that is currently under preparation. Okay, so I'll switch gears a little bit and I'll tell you, I'll give you a little preview of other things that we're working on the lab now. Uh, I spend a lot of time trying to understand the stress response in the uh, different regions of the mouse brain. Uh, what I'll tell you today is uh, focuses particularly on the ventral hippocampus. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting region because of this, uh, their function, or its function or its relevance for anxiety and stress, as well as um, uh, its, function again, uh, regulating uh, antidepressant response. And so again, this is a region that is quite interesting to me. Um, and what we basically have done is we've tried to understand how stress looks in the hippocampus, right? Uh, using single cell uh, technologies and, and resolution. So what you see here is something that we call a dot plot. So basically this gives you information of uh, changes in gene expression per particular different cluster. So you can see here that we can differentiate not only what is a neuron that is excitatory or inhibitory, being glutamatergic or GABAergic, but we also can differentiate particular subclusters of these cells, as well as glial and vascular cells. Uh, the dots that you see here are a representation of the changes uh, in gene expression. So the larger that you see the circle is the larger the number of genes that are differentially expressed, and the color that is associated is with the uh, uh, level of significance or fault changes that we're seeing. Uh, now, after looking, we you know we've done this across multiple regions. Again, not only the hippocampus, but in the cortex, in the hypothalamus, as I just showed you, and uh, as well as all the tissue in the periphery. And what we can see is that there's a very particular signature or molecular signature of stress under baseline conditions per se uh, across this region. So, after looking at these plots over and over again. I would always think about, you know, like a skyline or a particular signature of stress, right? And so if I show you the skylines of cities, you know, you are able to, just by looking at this picture, recognize uh, what the cities are, right? I don't need to tell you that you're looking at New York, London, and hopefully you guys recognize that the bottom is real. Uh, but again, you don't need a lot of information other than just these, like, these specific peaks or landmarks that we can see to recognize it. And this is something that we see, per se, uh, for example, in the hippocampus. Uh, so we can see these specific peaks of activity in particular neurons. It's not all the neurons or all the glutamatergic neurons in the hippocampus that are responding the same way. It's particular neurons in the, the, the gyrus or CA1 or CA3, or particularly subpopulations of astrocytes that are activity. And this is quite consistent. We can see it in the hippocampus. We can see a very different signature in the hypothalamus. And if I show you different regions like the cortex, we'll see something slightly different. So again, this is quite powerful because once we understand how the signature stress works, we can then manipulate it and see how it's affected, right? And so here, for example, if we go back to this plot, the top plot on the left, you can see how by a simple manipulation that we've done, and in this case, it's exposing mice to an early life stress, we can see that the expression of the changes in the different cell types changes dramatically when we usually see these very strong peaks of activity in glutamatergic neurons that are completely inhibited. And now we see a complete shift into a very strong um, uh, changes or activity of GABAergic neurons. So this talks about this uh, inhibitory, excitatory violence in the brain that we can see it at the transcriptomic level. So it's very, very interesting. Again, like I said, you can modify the system in multiple ways. We can do this at the level of genetics. So for example, we can knock out a particular gene uh, that is very important for the stress response. As in the case, for example, uh, glucocorticoid or mineral cortical receptors, GR or MR. We've done something like this and, and we presented mice to a stressor under knockout conditions, under baseline conditions. Uh, we have generated the largest uh, data set of ventral hippocampus data after stress um, that is available now, about 160,000 cells. 
Uh, this is a very strong resolution of what's happening uh, in the brain. We've also created uh, um, a tool for people to use this data, log in, you can use the data, look at what's happening in the gene of interest that you're looking at. If you're interested in, I don't know, gene A or gene B, you can see where is it expressed in the ventral hippocampus and how it's being affected by stress uh, or how is it being affected by a knockout, for example. So this is a very powerful data set. Uh, it's currently submitted to cell. Uh, another project, which is what I just previously briefly described, we can also manipulate the environment. As I said earlier, we can expose mice, for example, to um, early life stressor or adversity after the, the, the mice are born. You can do this uh, prior to their born with the, with the dam is pregnant. You can do it at adolescence and so on. So the manipulations of stress and environment are quite powerful. We have done a project and we've done this, presented mice to this environment, uh, produce a large data set and showed this inhibition, um, excitatory balance uh, disruption that I mentioned uh, earlier. I'm not gonna dwell and go too much into this data set, um, but it's a beautiful story that is currently on the review in science and hopefully I get to tell you a bit more about this in the future. Now, I would like to finally switch gears one last time and tell you about this uh, last uh, study, uh, which is something that I've been working on for the last five years during my postdoc, and it's a project that is dear to my heart because it's something that I'm very interested in, which is uh, trying to understand variability and address the delay in treatment response. I've done a lot of work in antidepressants through my postdoc and, 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 and my PhD. So again, this is something that I, I worked on, and it's a you know, very nice story. So again, this deals with uh, variability and delay in treatment response. We know that, as I mentioned earlier, approximately 40% of patients do not show an adequate response to traditional antidepressants. Uh, we know that the positive effects of the medication for those who get better uh, takes about four to 10 weeks on that they start seeing uh, the positive effects of the medication. And this could be quite difficult, right? Uh, and this is particularly difficult for patients that are elevated, that are at elevated risk for suicide, such as depressed patients, right? Um, so over the last decade or so, ketamine has come out as a very interesting alternative uh, as an antidepressant. Uh, we know that a single sub-anesthetic administration of ketamine leads to fast and sustained antidepressant effects. And when I mean fast and sustained, I'm talking about within hours of treatment. And these effects can last up to, up to seven days, uh, which is very uh, in con different in contrast to what I just mentioned uh, about traditional antidepressants that usually take 10 to 12 weeks um, so these effects of ketamine have been shown in treatment-resistant depressed uh, as well as bipolar patients. Um, it's also been shown in PTSD patients. Um, these effects have been demonstrated in various animal models. Of course, not everything is perfect. Uh, there's still a lot of questions that remain, uh, such as, you know, there's not uh, a uniform or still not lack of consensus uh, in what is the best protocol to, uh, to use ketamine. There's concerns about its side effects, what are the long-term effects, uh, if there's any addictive effects of the medication, uh, and so on. Um, so, and in addition, we know that the exact mechanisms of action um, are yet to be identified. There is still a lot of interest in the medication, uh, but still a lot of information missing. So we thought again that using cell type specific information will be a very interesting way to try to dive into these mechanisms. Uh, I We believe that some of these mechanisms that were missing were still at large, partially due to uh, shortcomings of the current technologies, uh, being in particular, for example, lack of cell type specific information. And so again, like I said, this is something where single cell transcriptomics can really shed some uh, powerful light. So the experiment is quite simple. We take mice, uh, we uh, treat them with either a cell line solution or ketamine. Um, we wait two days, and uh, this is important that we take two days. I'll go back to this uh, in, a minute, in a minute uh, about why we do this specific time point. And then we dissect the ventral hippocampus and we prepare uh, single cell suspensions. Uh, we then perform a single cell uh, experiment. We quantify the individual cells as I mentioned in the past. Uh, we can see that there's no changes at the level of populations. I mean, just by giving an injection of ketamine, we're not expecting to see a new cell type emerge like we saw in the project that I, um, that I described earlier in the adrenal gland, right? Uh, this is just an acute treatment with a medication. But what we found was um, differentially expressed genes that are cell type specific. So we saw that there are changes that are specific to glutamatergic neurons, so astrocytes, and, and, and so on. Uh, 
So we're able to identify, again, Felder-specific transcriptional signatures that are associated with the sustained antidepressant effects of ketamine. Uh, and then this is important, again, sustained, um, because uh, when we think about ketamine, we think about two uh, different mechanisms of action. We think about its fast and immediate mechanisms of action that happen within 30 minutes uh, or within hours of, of administration. And then what is happening uh, later, like for example, two days later, what are the sustained effects that we can still see the effects, um, the antidepressant effects while the medication has been completely uh, dissipated from, from the system, which usually happens about two hours after, the, after administration that the drug is completely uh, metabolized. So it's interesting to understand, again, what is happening later on. What are these downstream mechanisms that are affected that are maintaining this fast uh, response to the medication? Now, again, this was a very interesting point in this project, but also quite difficult because it's very difficult to validate these findings when you look at the cell type specific level. It's not like the first project that I mentioned, and again, that we look at a specific populational cells that emerge. I mean, this is very easy to validate using a scope or the manual histochemistry because we just looked if the cell type is present or not. But when you're looking at small changes in a particular cell type, then things became a little bit trickier. So we had to be creative here. And what we did is we generated a mouse model or mouse line uh, where these mice express, uh, we can genetically uh, label all glutamatergic neurons in the forebrain of these mice that includes the ventral hippocampus. Um, and then we can then isolate this, uh, these cells uh, and separate those that are glutamatergic or not based on the expression of, of, of TD tomato. Um, so what basically what we did is we uh, took these mice, we treated them again, just saline or ketamine as we did in the original cohort that I showed you. We then, instead of doing a single cell experiment, we prepared all suspensions and we uh, isolated whole cells using facts. Um, and what, what we have essentially at the end is two populations of cells. Uh, some that express or that are TD tomato positive, and these are glutamatergic neurons, or those are uh, TD tomato negative that are all the remaining cells. And not only gabaergic neurons, but everything else that is there. And we can then quantify this using uh, qPCR, basically as we would do at both levels. So we're not validating cell type at uh, the cell type specific, uh, the, uh, the single cell level, but we're validating at the population level, which again is quite uh, insightful and, and good for our purposes. And so what we did is we went back to our single cell data. We focus on glutamatergic neurons because it's where we found the largest changes uh, for a cell type. And we randomly took uh, eight genes that were differentially expressed. We took four upregulated and four downregulated as well. And what you can see here is that not only that these genes are significant, but also the directionality was also consistent. We can see that the upregulated, we're still upregulated, the downregulated, and downregulated, but we did not see any changes on these genes in the TD tomato negative cells. Again, suggesting that these changes are happening um, that are cell-type specific, are happening only in glutamatergic norms. Um, so for the rest of my talk, I'll focus on this particular gene, which is called casing Q2, which is where we saw the strongest uh, changes, both the single cell data as well as in the uh, validation that we did at the population level. Now we were then able to then um, use another validation. We took primary neurons from mouse hippocampus. It's a good model because these primary neurons are mostly excitatory, mostly glutamatergic neurons. Uh, and so we can then we quantify the expression of all these genes. I'm only showing you case in Q2 because again, this is where we saw the largest changes. And as you can see here, um, we see changes at multiple time points uh, with ketamine. We also treat ourselves with the, the metabolite of ketamine, which we call Hank ketamine. Uh, and we can see that uh, we see a very strong effect with both ketamine and Hank ketamine on multiple uh, levels. So again, suggesting that both in vivo and in vitro, case in Q2, uh, case in Q2 uh, could be an important target of ketamine action in glutamatergic neurons of the hippocampus. Okay, so if we go back to try to understand, or if I can tell you a little bit more about this potassium uh, channel, so this case in Q2 gene, and it's a potassium voltagated channel. Um, it plays a very important role in the regulation of neuronal excitability. Um, we know that in combination with the case in Q3 gene uh, forms a particular channel uh, that is called the case in Q channel. And this, case, this case in Q channel produces a very particular uh, current. It's also known as the M channel, and this current uh, is known as the M current. And this is important 
uh, because this current ensures that the neuron is not constantly active or, or overexcitable. Um, and what is very interesting for us was that this current can be manipulated pharmacologically. We can specifically isolate this M current and record it as well. Uh, now, most of what we know about case in Q2, it's been known in the context of epilepsy, uh, but there's a few studies now coming up over the last couple of years linking the expression of these two genes, case in Q2 and 3, um, in, uh, you know, associated with stress and, and mechanisms of active resilience, for example. Okay, so as I mentioned, we can isolate and record the activity of this end current. And that's something that we essentially did. We, we took our, our in vitro model, we took our primary neurons, we treat these neurons with uh, ketamine uh, or saline, and then we can then isolate and record uh, the current, uh, the case, this KMCQ current. And what you can see here is that there's an increase in the current density um, in cells that are being treated with ketamine. And essentially what we can do is we did the same thing uh, in vivo, basically, we treat mice same as we did in the first few cohorts that I mentioned. We then take this uh, mice and we uh, extract uh, the brains and we can record from the uh, ventral hippocampus and we can essentially um, obtain identical results what we see in vitro. So again, what we're seeing here is that this indicates the case in Q2 mRNA expression that we observed in, in our uh, single cell data and other models, it is complemented by a significant gain in the number of case and Q channels uh, that have happened both in vitro and ex vivo. It also further supports the idea that uh, regulating uh, the, the expression of case and Q2 uh, or the modulation of these channels in glutamatergic neurons of the ventricular campus could be a potential target uh, for new medications for the treatment of depression. Okay, so, now we wanted to do something more functional. We wanted to see what happens when we modulate or we manipulate the, the function of this channel. So what we did is we knocked down using some viruses, uh, we knocked down the expression of case in Q2. Uh, you can see here uh, that we can, in cells, both in cells and in vivo, we can knock down the expression of case in Q2 about 50%. And this is important because we don't want to knock out the gene completely because this will lead into, um, into epileptic seizures, for example, in mice, right? So we need to make sure that the gene is still expressed, but what we would see in, in basically what would happen in, in a regular um, uh, occurring uh, polymorphism mutation in humans, for example, so 50% reduction. So what we do is we knock down the expression of these genes. Uh, so these are some uh, of the brains so where the viruses were injected. And then we took these mice either they were presented to either a control virus, a uh, scramble control or a case in Q2 knockdown. And then we take these mice and we uh, treat them directly with uh, saline or ketamine randomly for both groups. And then what we did is we tried to look at the behaviors uh, or how they behave after treatment. And for this, we uh, implemented the use of the four swim test. This is a test that is commonly used to assess antidepressant-like behaviors uh, in mice. Uh, and what we look at is the time that the mouse is in mobile in, or active, uh, actively swimming in water or in mobile. And we can see here is that in those mice who receive the control virus, so there's not knockdown of case in Q2 in these mice, we can see a decrease in the mouse that the, uh, and the time that, the, that these mice uh, spent in mobile in, in water. Uh, and this is usually attributed to uh, an antidepressant-like response. But once we knock down casing Q2 in these mice, this effect is completely abolished. Uh, again, indicating that the ventral hippocampus uh, is an important site for casing Q function and for the antidepressant effects of ketamine. Okay, so next, I was interested in trying to understand how stress can modulate or affect uh, the expression of casing Q2 in the ventral hippocampus. Up until now, what I show you is what happens when we inject the mice with ketamine? And these mice are naive animals, they're not stressed, uh, but what happens when we present them under a stress phenotype? And what we do is we present mice to the chronic social defeat protocol that I uh, explained earlier in my talk. Uh, but for this, we use this next Cree AI9 line, which is this line where we can label the glutamatergic neurons of the hippocampus. Uh, and so we stress our mice. And then what we can see here is that we see an increase into the time that the animal spends in mobile, which is the opposite of what you showed you. So basically stress leads to uh, an increase in the uh, in mobile time. And what we can see is a decrease of K-SYNQ2 in glutamatergic neurons. Uh, 
which is again is the opposite of what we showed or, or what I showed you once you inject mice with ketamine. So what we can see is that chronic stress decreases the expression, particularly in glutamatic ignorance, because we don't see any changes of, of this gene in the remaining cell types that we can see in uh, TD tomato negative cells. Now, once we treat these mice with, uh, yeah, before I, I said, I should mention that, so this was done at the population level, as I mentioned, but we also took samples uh, using bulk tissue. Bulk tissue is just basically, we took punches of, uh, of areas of the brain without having any uh, tissue specificity or cell type specificity. Uh, and what we can see here is that there's a slight decrease, but it's not a significant difference, suggesting that again, uh, this is something that it's been missed in other studies, right? Uh, you need cell type specific information to see this. Now, when we then go one step ahead or one step further, and then we, after chronic stress, we can inject ketamine and treat these mice, we can see that we completely rescue all these effects. We can see a decrease now in the four sim test. We can see that the uh, levels of KCQ2 go back to baseline levels, as we would see in the, on, on the baseline animals on the control mice. And again, we see no changes at, at the bulk tissue level. Now, this demonstrates that casing Q2 mRNA is altered after chronic stress exposure in glutamatergic neurons for the ventricular campus, and that these uh, effects can be reversed by uh, ketamine treatment. Now, we also know that these uh, cell type specific effects could be diluted, disrotted, uh, or dis, uh, thwarted in other studies using brain homogenase or whole tissue samples, as I mentioned, based on our uh, bulk tissue findings. Okay, but how is ketamine regulated in case in Q2 mRNA expansion? So I draw this cartoon to kind of walk you through the process. Uh, and again, this is a very uh, simplistic <laughs> version of what's happening. Uh, because what I'm showing you here now is a summary of about 20 years of research into ketamine. So we know that ketamine blocks the uh, uh, the NMD receptor from glutamate. We also know that it can potentiate the activity of AMPA receptors, leading to a cascade of calcium into the cell that leads into the known mechanisms that we have heard of about ketamine. This is the involvement of mTOR, uh, BDNF, um, and many other pathways that have been um, heavily studied and, and shown to be effective. Now, what we're also seeing is that these calcium channels uh, that are perceived by this calcium uh, signaling molecules, such as modulin, can lead to a different mechanism. And this is work that was shown by the laboratory of Mark Shapiro, the University of Texas, who very nicely show that through calmodulin um, and the formation of this complex, which is the ACAP calmodulin and calcellarin complex, can lead to increased activation of casing Q uh, mRNA. And this is specific to the casing Q2 gene and not casing Q3. So what we thought is, can ketamine, uh, you know, in the experiments of Shapiro, they showed that calcium does this. Now, we wanted to see if ketamine can modulate the systems. Now, one of the first things that we noticed is that some of the key players in this pathway or these genes are already significantly dysregulated in our single cell data. We can see called modulins, one, both variants of the gene, ACAP5, which is this very important, uh, anchor protein for this path, for, for this complex, as well as casing Q2, which we've been talking about for a while. And again, what is really interesting here is that we can modulate or manipulate the function of these key uh, molecules um, uh, in, in the system in vitro. And so essentially that's what we did. We, take, we took cell lines, we treat them with either uh, cell line, ketamine, or ketamine in combination with its inhibitors. And what we're able to see is that, you know, ketamine sh uh, shows an increase of basically what we've seen and what I've shown you earlier in the talk. But once you combine ketamine with these inhibitors, you completely abolish the upregulation of casein Q2 of the changes at the transcriptome level, suggesting that this uh, calcium channels, called modulin and calcinerin, play a tr uh, uh, an important role in the regulation of casein Q2 through ketamine. And this result describe again, a previously unknown mechanism of action for casein Q2. So we're not claiming that this is the mechanism of action, we just, elucidating a new part of the mechanism that was previously unknown. Now, I would like to have a couple more minutes to, to tell you about our some pharmacological manipulations that we did uh, by manipulating this gene. So we can uh, basically 
uh, use very specific inhibitors or activators of casein Q channels, such as XC991, as well as retigabin. We can treat mice with ketamine and see in the fluoroxamine test a nice down regulation, as I showed you earlier. But if you treat mice then with a second injection of an inhibitor, these effects are completely abolished. On the other hand, if you combine ketamine with an activator, as you can see here with this activated reticabin, we see a stronger effect on medication. And this was very, very interesting because it suggests a synergistic effect of these two drugs. Now, I've shown you behavioral data using one test, which is the porcelain test. We wanted to explore these using a more complex uh, uh, way to assess behavior. And for this, we implemented the social boxes, uh, which is a system that has been developed uh, in the hen lab, which is uh, the place where I did my postdoc uh, for over 10 years now. Uh, and it's a system that uses a high throughput uh, behavioral phenotyping system. Uh, it allows for the uh, continuous tracking of a large variety of behavioral readouts. Uh, but what's important here is that it's in multiple groups of mice, or mice, it's not just one mouse at a time. Uh, it provides information on behaviors that are not detectable in standard paradigms. Uh, this is a more etiological relevant environment, which requires very minimal experimental intervention. So these are all arenas. Uh, and I'll show you a quick video here um, that can see, so you can see how we track the behavior of these mice. So we have an arena here, you can see mice that are painted in different colors so we can track them. And we can see how they're interacting, how they're behaving, uh, what's happening after a manipulation, such as we did with ketamine. Um, but what's important here is that we're obtaining this information in the context of a group behavior. Uh, we understand how their hierarchies are changing, how their individual behaviors are changing, but again, how the whole group is changing. So this is a very powerful method to, to quantify behavior in a high throughput way over long periods of time. Okay, so what we did is we put mice into the social arenas. This is again, their living environment, it's an enriched environment. We let them uh, interact and live freely for four days. And we use this time to record them and get some baseline recordings of their behaviors. After the fortnight, we inject them with ketamine or saline, and then, then we monitor the behaviors for two days. So using uh, essentially machine learning uh, algorithms to try to understand what is happening. This is completely oblivious of what treatment we give the system uh, doesn't know this. Uh, and we completely already see a separation here between those mice who receive ketamine and those who receive uh, saline. But again, this is a bit of a black box. We don't know, we know they're different, but we don't know why they're different. So you can then look deeper into the data you can uh, go ahead and then we can see what are the behaviors that are uh, adding to these differences. So for example, in this case, is the distance that the mice are spending away from the walls, how much time they spend going away from their nest, the time that they spend in mobile in the arena and areas that are open and so on and so on. So we can then use this information to build, for example, a predictive model that can then lead us to see this is how an animal behaves after ketamine into social boxes. And then we can see what happened to be modulated which is basically what we did here. So we take mice, we put into the cell phenot for the same system. They are behaving in the, in the boxes for four days so we can get their baseline recordings. But now we treat them with cell line ketamine and uh, retigabin, which is the activator that I mentioned be before that shows a stronger effect uh, when in combination with ketamine. And essentially using this predictive algorithm is we can see essentially the same thing. We see that mice treated with ketamine shows a difference between those that are controls, but it's those mice who are treated with ketamine and retigabin that show a stronger response. Again, consistent with our four swim samples, but suggesting that pharmacological manipulation of case and Q channels modulate antidepressant response in a semi-naturalistic environment. And finally, just to close here, we went a step further to see how retig if retigabin can augment the antidepressant effects of ketamine. And so what we see here is I show you uh, until now uh, effects of two days, but we wanted to see what happens after five days or seven days after a single injection of ketamine. And what we can see here is that at both five days, we see an effect of ketamine. At seven days, we lose the effects of ketamine. But what's interesting is in combination, we can see still a strong effect even after seven days. We can also see that uh, using half of the medication, so here on the left side, you can see ketamine as 10 milligram uh, per kilogram, which is what we've been describing or talking about the whole time. But when we use Different dosages, we don't see the effect. Now, in combination with retigabin, we can see a stronger effect with 10 milligrams, but even at five, we didn't see effects before, we now see a strong effect. And finally, we are able to see that after two days, not only we can see changes in the behavior, but we can also see changes of case in Q2, anglo neurosis on the hippocampus.
uh, that these effects are specific to ketamine because when we treat mice with escitalopram, which is a traditional antidepressant or SSRI, we don't see any effects. And this again only happens in glutamatergic neurons. So this result further implied that uh, there's a synergistic effect of ketamine and reticamine. Um, there's a lack of effect with uh, classic uh, antidepressants, suggesting that it's a ketamine specific role. Um, Reticabin, the activator, is a drug that has been developed for the treatment of epilepsy, but it's been recently shown in humans uh, that it's been associated with improvement in depressive symptoms. Uh, it's been shown that it's well tolerated and no serious side effects have happened, uh, but, but this, in order to see this effect, uh, this has been shown after chronic uh, uh, treatment. So these effects are not seen up until 10 weeks of treatment. Our data suggests that if you combine ketamine with reticabin, you can see stronger and sustained longer effects uh, with the combination of the two drugs. Now, these are two FDA-approved medications, uh, which are basically available and ready to use. Um, uh, and based on our, our findings, um, alone hand, which is my postdoc supervisor, and I have filed a provisional patent for the use of ketamine and retigamine for the use of, uh, of MDD. And now to finalize, uh, uh, we propose that the case in Q gene is involved in mediating the sustained antidepressant effects of ketamine, that the adjunctive uh, treatment of ketamine and reticabin augments into the present effects of ketamine, but ultimately it provides a deeper understanding of the complex mechanisms underlying the antidepressant effects of ketamine with very important implications. And again, this is, if we keep everything in the context of cell type specific or single cell technologies, it's another beautiful example of how starting from a hypothesis uh, open uh, project by using cell type uh, information led us to a completely unknown mechanism. Uh, this story was recently, in fact, last week, it was accepted in Neuron. So hopefully you will be able to see this very soon um, available uh, for everybody. Uh, with this, I would like to thank everybody who's here. Uh, I hope you're still there because I cannot see any anybody's faces. Um, of course, everybody who's particip participated in this project, um, Alon Hen, who is my postdoc supervisor, he's now the uh, president of the Vice Man Institute in Science. He has left the Max Planck where I did my postdoc. Uh, all the members of his lab uh, or collaborators at the Max Planck, uh, Kicks College London, the University of Zurich, and, and everyone else who participated. Um, so with this, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you're still there and <laughs> I can answer some of your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Juan, for this presentation. It's a brilliant lecture, very interesting data. And we have one question about your first paper. Did you look at stress-induced changes in gene expression in older animals and mice, older mice? Uh, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Did you look at stress-induced changes in gene expression in older mice? Uh, so that's a good question. No, for that particular project, we've only looked at the changes or at the, you know, at the HPA level in young adults. So we did not look at changes uh, in later in adulthood. Um, we are looking now at what happens in adolescence, for example, which is also very interesting. Uh, but that study in particular was only done in young adults. The mice were about uh, seven, uh, seven to nine weeks uh, old. Okay. I have a question. Uh, I'm, I'm studying a neurogenetic disorder, including uh, Huntington Parkinson and Alzheimer. And uh, we know that depression is a very important aspect of this disease. And uh, when you're talking about the study of these uh, patients, we have one difficult to find biomarkers that can be used in order to test uh, some therapies in a clinic for clinical purpose, for example. So considering your results and uh, based on the fact that uh, there are many evidence literature that the gene ABCB12 uh, is uh, overexpressed in patients with Huntington disease, for example, you consider that you can use the levels of uh, ACTG or cortisol as a biomarker for these patients? I would, so if I understand your question correctly, um, you're saying that uh, ABCB1 has been associated with Huntington disease and there's changes in glucocorticoids uh, or ACTH. And if you could use this as a biomarker, um, I, would, I, would say, I would say no, because we have not seen that yet. I mean, this is something that is not as reliable that you would see. I think 
uh, court is an approximation of what's happening with the stress response, and it is regulated, of course, um, but it's not a very reliable biomarker for, uh, for you know, psychiatric disorders as well. So for something like Huntington's, I don't think it would be a good marker. I mean, if it was, we would have already picked it up and seen it a long time ago. I think we need to look deeper into the mechanisms, why court is changing in these systems, right? And this is how these data sets, for example, uh, in the case that we started looking at stress or an interest in psychiatric disorders, we can then go and see changes or differences in a different disorder like that is similar, like Cushing's disease, right? So it's not that we know that there is uh, higher levels of glucocorticoids in that, right? Uh, okay. It's very clear by, by, by the tumor that the patients are getting in the pituitary, but it's really understanding the mechanism of why that leads to that increase that would be uh, important. Uh, now, or at least to me, <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, now, if the second part of your question is, can you do this as a biomarker? Now, for a biomarker to be effective, it is something that needs to be easily accessible and reliable, right? Uh, so obtaining a piece of your adrenal gland is not very practical, right? So we just really have to see how you can get to these things. Now, if we keep it in the context of cell type specific or single cell technologies, perhaps looking at peripheral biomarkers by looking and seeing this cell type specific uh, information can gather this information. Up until now, we can see, I've done a lot of work in my PhD looking at biomarkers in blood and plasma, but we can see expression of that, you know, 30,000 genes in this population, but we don't know which are the cell types. So here using these technologies, it could lead you perhaps to this. Thank you. We have time for one only question. So uh, did you check the epigenetic mechanisms that may be uh, involved in the ketamine induced response? Sorry, can you repeat? I, I lost you a little bit there. Did you check the epigenetic mechanisms that may be involved in a ketamine-induced response? No, that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is some of the things that I am exploring in my, in my laboratory, my, in my independent laboratory now, because we know what the changes are, for example. We know that the changes in gene expression are happening. Let's say we can give you the example of ABCP1 for the first study or, or, or casing Q2. We see the changes, but understanding the regulation by looking at epigenomic mechanisms as well as other epigenomic mechanisms, not only methylation, for example, but also the involvement of non coding RNAs, for example, uh, would be very important. So, understanding what regulates those changes. Again, you know, if we use the same analogy that I gave you, court, it's not seeing what court is changing, but it's what's causing those changes, right? That is it's fascinating. It's very interesting to me, of course. Okay. Thanks so much for later. It's very interesting uh, data. All right, thank you very much, and um, thank you for the invitation.